Welcome to Wowfest Lockdown, the 20th edition of Writing on the Walls Annual Festival and the first to be delivered online. My name's Stuart Borthwick and I'm Chair of Writing on the Wall and I'm host for uh, this evening's event with Phil Scranton. I spoke to Phil earlier on today and Phil has provided us with a new title for his event and it's now called Protecting Life, Interrogating Death, Seeking Truth. A particular welcome to those of you for whom this is your first Writing on the Wall event. You're very welcome. Um, if you find this evening's event uh, memorable, interesting, please consider attending future festival events when we are able to deliver them to you in person. Um, if you are able to make a donation, that is uh, very welcome. Uh, we're taking donations through our Eventbrite page and all donations are going to Liverpool fans uh, supporting food banks, South Liverpool domestic abuse services and writing on the wall. Now it's always a pleasure to welcome Phil Scranton to a writing on the wall event. He's been a, a great fan of the organisation for many years and um, we're very proud to support his work and uh, we always feel very proud when he uh, is able to present at our festival. Um, I think that Phil has been involved with writing on the wall uh, for so many years uh, for a number of reasons, but I think primarily it's because he shares so many values uh, that we have at writing on the wall. Um, values that, uh, uh, that say that words have meaning, um, that words and actions matter, um, a belief that writing and activism can change things for the better a belief that ordinary people have rights, uh, but if those rights are to be retained, they must be continually fought for. Tonight, Phil is gonna be joining the dots. He's gonna be joining the dots between the way the state responded to the deaths of the 96 at Hillsborough and the way that the state is currently responding to the deaths in care homes during this current coronavirus pandemic. So could I have a very quick round, virtual round of applause? I'm gonna hand over to Phil, thank you. Hello Stuart, thank you uh, very much for that uh, generous uh, introduction. And it's great to be with WOW, even though we are virtually together. For those people who don't know my association, uh, with WOW, of course, I'm from the city and uh, over the years, the work that I've done around Hillsborough, but also uh, around a whole series of other issues that are Liverpool related from my work on the police uh, during the, um, the uprisings in Liverpool 8, uh, right the way through to the coal dispute and supporting families outside of Liverpool throughout the, the coal dispute. And then of course, um, the death of Jimmy Kelly in uh, police custody. That's been, uh, I suppose, uh, my history um, in a nutshell. Uh, and obviously I've carried on that work since um, I, I've, I've come to live in Belfast. I've been here 17 years now and obviously do a lot of work in uh, the North in terms of prisons, uh, in terms of the uh, whole history of the conflict here. Uh, but also with children and young people. Throughout all this time, the 30 years uh, plus, uh, I've worked on Hillsborough and worked with families and survivors around Hillsborough. And I'm going to be talking to some extent around that this evening, but I'm also going to be talking about a case with which I've been involved very recently here in the north of Ireland and how that connects us into the COVID-related deaths. And I think it's uh, not just a forced association. I think as I begin this talk, you'll realize that it has very clear, close connections in terms of the legitimacy we give the state, the authority the state has, and how uh, it fails in its levels of accountability. So I'll, uh, I'll begin with, uh, with, with my um, talk now and um, thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate what is happening in terms of the WOW Fest continuing.
I'm waiting for my slides. I think they'll come now. So I chose the topic uh, this evening uh, of protecting life, interrogating death and seeking truth because death in contested circumstances, death uh, is particularly at the hands of the state is absolutely crucial when we consider the duty that the state has to protect life and also the duty that a democratic society has, a democratic state has to provide us with truth when doubts are raised about state responsibility. I wanted to start with just a couple of slides that are uh, concern my contextual work in relation to critical analysis. Uh, I every now and then be saying, next slide please, because I can't operate it from Belfast. Here comes the first slide. And it's the significance and importance of what we call doing critical research. What makes critical social research uh, different? What makes critical social research distinctive? from sociological research and the other social sciences, uh, what does that word critical really mean? So uh, to move on, it would be uh, initially, from my perspective, the questioning of power and how power operates at a whole range of levels within our society, not just state power, but also economic power, um, power in the local and national state, and how that converts into authority. What, does, what authority do, does the state uh, have in terms of how it controls, contests, and all the rest of it, our lives? And how is the state gain legitimacy? That is a crucial issue here, which is to, um, is to argue around the fact of how a state legitimates itself. In a democratic society, we uh, are very, very clearly involved in holding state institutions to account, both local state institutions, but also national state institutions. And we shouldn't take official discourse, if the last few months have taught us anything, it is that official discourse is not reliable. We always have to have a skeptical view and to challenge, the, uh, to challenge official discourse as it comes to us, okay. Uh, and that moving on to how we work on that in terms of, Challenging official discourse is prioritizing what I consider to be a fundamental right, the right to know, the right of knowledge in the society in, we, in which we live. Also important is to break this commitment, this continual to commitment to the self, understanding the lives of others, walking in other people's shoes. That becomes part of a process, from my point of view, of critical research. And of course, what this affirms is the view that we so rarely see, the view from below. Most of, the, most of the issues that we face in day to day life, whether it's coming through state institutions or any other form of authority, is the view from above. History is written from above. What I'm concerned about is the view from below. Okay. What does the view from below look like? Okay. It's the, um, first of all, the, the issue of breaking the silence. Breaking the silence, that which, which is hidden from us. How do we bear witness? How do we bear witness to that which goes on around us? How do we bear witness to the big issues of our time? And from my point of view, as a social analyst, it's hearing testimonies. It's not about secondhand work. It's about actually being among the testimonies of those people who are giving us that view from below. That is the only way that we can recover truth. Notice truth is in parenthesis. Of course, truth is relative. But from my point of view, there are real truths. And I want to talk about that this evening. I also want to talk about the challenging of deceit. The deceit that is there within institutional forms, the deceit that is there within the state, within state institutions. Goodness knows in the last weeks, we've had enough deceit. And also I want to go back to C. Wright Mills, his contextual issue of personal troubles. We all face personal troubles. Everyone watching this has personal troubles. But how do we connect those personal troubles to the public issues of our time? How the public issues contain those troubles, how they are part of the broader, lesser known issues, lesser obvious issues that we have to face. Okay. 
Personal experiences, really vital, important, the view from inside our histories, our personal histories, but also we don't live in a vacuum. We live in social cultural histories, all that goes on around us, the world as it is now, but as we've inherited it through those histories. And connected to that, absolutely central, is political economic context. If ever a period of time has demonstrated the significance of political economy for those of us living in an advanced capitalist world, it is now. People with having to use food banks as they did before the pandemic, but actually accentuating the issue of how fragile in reality political economy is. Within this, our personal experiences, the shared social, psychological material loss and the injustices that are around us. That which brings to us as individuals, as families, acute stress, physical illness, and of course, at this time, premature death, okay. COVID-19 and deaths in care. The whole concept of care is a place of safety, okay? And that place of safety has been violated through COVID-19. When we look at the deaths in care, we can't miss the fact every night, and some of you watching this will have suffered and endured this, how families are distanced, how they're excluded, how they're distraught, because they're excluded from being there, from being in the moment, that which we always share in life, which is sharing death. They've been excluded from that. And in that situation, the pressure on care staff to take their place, as well as the pressure professionally on care staff, the pressure on them to fill in, to be there at that moment so that families know that their loved one was cared for. And we can see that extended just today at the end of our road at the church. I watched a limited funeral with people standing a distance from each other. That is so clearly against all of the processes of our lives. Funerals are times when we're together, when we hug, when we love, when we show our respect for each other. Okay. And the aftermath, the aftermath of COVID-19 related deaths. How do we access timelines, both personal and institution? What actually did happen in the process of the buildup to the death of a loved one? that personal experience. How was that institutionalized? What happened in the institution? How was it diagnosed? How is it treated? And what issues of concern might we have for that? Not in every case, but certainly in those cases from which we're distanced and which we need to know. And deaths in care is one of those areas where those issues of concern are most clear. And of course, in all of this, while people are at the lowest ebb, they're anticipating investigation. They're anticipating inquests into the deaths of their loved ones. How do they face that? What do we know from our previous analysis, our previous work with bereaved families struggling in similar situations? What do we know that will help us today? Okay. Inquests are always the site where contested deaths arrive, okay? The issue at the moment that is so clear is, believe it or not, there is no statutory duty to hold inquests into COVID-related deaths. And yet inquests are expected to investigate the circumstances of death who died, when they died, where they died, and most importantly, how they died. That how is to explain the context of death, but it must always exclude personal liability. You cannot hold someone responsible for a death in a coroner's court. It's an examination of the facts. It's the hearing of witness testimonies. And for families, legal representation, in the North of Ireland, legal aid, not so in England. And also for contested deaths, juries, where people like you and me 
off the street will come in and hear the evidence and where they will come to a short form verdict, just one word or two words out of a panel of, of, of verdicts, but most importantly, and developed recently from campaigning, from Inquest, the organization, and from those of us who've worked on Inquests for a long time, a narrative verdict, a verdict that tells the story of death, okay. What this means is that when deaths are contested, the phrase I always use is it becomes an adversarial wolf in inquisitorial sheep's clothing. It's an inquiry, but it's also adversarial because in contested deaths, this is the only place where families can have that contestation heard. Okay. For the bereaved, however, inquests are specific. They're specific to their loss. And that is why they are so significant in contested death. For every single person who died at Hillsborough, 96, the inquests became absolutely focal on an individual basis for their families. Okay. Hillsborough was about death and it was about survival. Okay. 15th of April, 1989, FA Cup semi-final, Liverpool play Nottingham Forest, one of the big, absolutely outstanding games of the year, a repeat of the previous year's semi-final. It's a neutral venue, as all semi-finals are. Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, fans coming from Liverpool, from Nottingham. A beautiful, warm, sunny day. Okay. 96 men, women and children were killed. They were killed on the terraces, behind the goal in the Leppings Lane end. Over 400 were seriously injured, thousands traumatized, and many have died prematurely since that day. When people say to me, how many people died at Hillsborough? It's an easy answer, 96. How many people have died because of, it, of Hillsborough? It's inestimable, okay. Hillsborough was a failure in process following the actual deaths. We looked to the state, we looked to the courts to actually take us through the process and deliver justice for the families and for the survivors. Okay. The official discourse goes like this. A judicial inquiry that was held and reported in 1989 under Lord Justice Taylor. Cause of death, overcrowding. Reasons for it, because the police failed to control the crowd at that end. However, that was lost. Criminal investigations, 1989 to 1990, the decision that there was no one to be held liable, no prosecutions of any individual or any organization. An inquest verdict at that time, the longest inquest in legal history, accidental death on a majority verdict. All the subsequent appeals and the judicial scrutiny brought about because of the family's campaigns for justice failed. And we were left clearly with an accidental death verdict. Okay. Throughout that time, however, there was an alternative discourse. We developed the Hillsborough project in the months after the disaster. In 1990, we wrote Hillsborough and after. In 95, we wrote No Lash Rights, where we critiqued all of the legal processes, including the coroner's inquest. Immediately after that, Liverpool playwright, filmmaker, Jimmy McGovern wrote the drama documentary Hillsborough, which was broadcast and won awards internationally. None of this appeared to make any difference. So in 1999, I published the first edition of Hills with the Truth. And I thought that my expose of the entire process would bring about a new investigation, a new inquiry. It didn't happen, okay. What we had was a lost decade, 10 years in which nothing happened, okay. 2010, and the details have been well rehearsed, 
an independent panel was established as a direct consequence of the Minister for State for Culture, Andy Burnham, making a commitment through the Labour government to something that had never happened before, an independent panel of inquiry. Okay. The findings of the independent panel, and I headed the research for the independent panel with my researchers based in Queen's University in Belfast, were quite clear and in contrast to the Taylor report and in contrast to all that had gone before. There was a clear and present danger. The stadium was unsafe. There was a known risk and it was run. There was an emer the emergency response was unprepared, was poorly executed. And the medical evidence, which we were able to revisit and reanalyze, even without bodies, was that many who died could have survived. We estimated it at 41. The investigations were flawed. The evidence was corrupted. Police and ambulance service personnel had their statements changed. The dead were criminalized. They ran criminal records checks on all who died. Police and ambulance officers' statements, as I've said, were not only reviewed, but were altered. And in this process, we were able to show that the media had been manipulated by the by senior police officer, by the police federation, and also by a Tory MP for the district in which the disaster occurred. Okay. The impact was massive. Two years after the panel was set up, the UK government made a double apology, an apology for all that the families had gone through as a result of the corruption of evidence, but also an apology for the deaths in the first place. The police conduct and criminal investigations were commissioned and inquest verdicts were quashed and new inquests ordered, okay. The new inquests, okay, followed on. Preliminary hearings, 2013 to 2014. The inquests themselves, 2014 to 2016. And this time, legal aid and full representation of all families. Previously, only 40 families had been represented because they'd had to pay for their representation and some just couldn't afford it. The coroner's summing up took from February to April, 2016. Okay. The jury verdict was quite different. After the two years of evidence, the jury found unanimously that all who died had been killed unlawfully. And in their narrative, they added 25 contributory factors against the police mainly, against the stadium owners, the safety engineers, local authority, and the ambulance service. Okay. The fans were exonerated. A direct question to the jury, were the fans in any way responsible for what happened at Hillsborough? And the jury fell person, she said, no. Okay. And I want to turn to a quite different situation. Having talked about the death of 96 and the inquest into the death of 96, I want to take one case here in the north of Ireland. Okay. Joseph Rainey was a much loved son, a much loved family member. And he went through a difficult period in his life as a young man. He had a history of involvement in his community, in his school, trips to, to America in terms of visiting other people, in other young people in America. But he went through that period that many of us go through, where you lose direction. He broke into a shop. He wasn't the greatest robber in the world. He was caught. He was taken to police custody. 
in police custody, he was depressed and suicidal. So much so that the police decided that his care plan should involve constant observation and CCTV monitoring. They considered him unfit for interview. Okay. Then, two days later, he was remanded to Hyde Bank Young Offenders Institution. On reception, the police forms that came with him, called the at-risk forms, specifying the risk that he was facing, the risk that he was, were neither read nor were they passed to the healthcare staff. On committal landing, the forms were not read. No prisoner at risk, known as a SPA form, was opened. And yet Joseph told the nurse, I actually might hang myself with bed sheets. So the nurse opened a SPA, seeing that he was at risk. But two hours later, a senior officer dismissed the nurse's concern. Joseph made a Samaritan's call. And then soon after, he was observed writing a letter. After lockdown, he was found hanging in his cell. The letter he'd been writing was a note to his parents. At hospital, on life support, the prison service applied for a bail application to have him bailed. If that had been the case and he died in hospital, he would not have been technically a death in custody. It was turned down. Okay. On the 19th of April, 10 days later, in consultation with Joseph's parents, life support was withdrawn. Joseph's experiences in prison were not shared by the authorities with his family. They had to piece together the story for themselves. Okay. They made, man, mounted a quiet family-based campaign for justice, a commitment to seeking the details of his detention and the prison's duty of care. Soon after, they got in touch with me and I met with the family and then with Niall Murphy, securing legal representation. They challenged the adequacy and the detail of successive prisoner ombudsman's reports. In fact, two reports were sent back as being inadequate by the family and their legal representatives. Concerns were raised publicly in the media about Joseph's treatment. Finally, a jury, a jury inquest was to be held which brings with it full documentary disclosure. Okay. His inquest was earlier this year. I'd not been long out of hospital when I went to the final days of the inquest. Okay. The verdict was clear. Joseph died by his own hand, whilst the balance of his mind was disturbed. Okay. The findings, however, were remarkable. The jury found there were institutional failures, six in the transfer to and reception at prison of Joseph, three in the healthcare interview he received on arrival, which had been scant, and six further institutional failures of lack of care in those hours after he'd been committed to prison. And also, they found that the prison service had failed to implement previous recommendations from other deaths in custody. Okay. What this amounted to were systemic failures in staff training, suicide awareness, essential documentation, and the observation of prisoners at risk. 
In other words, the risk had been obvious. The risk had been obvious historically in terms of previous deaths. It had been obvious on the day in terms of Joseph's death, but it was also obvious in terms of the failure of the prison service over that period of time to in any way put in place that which would protect his life. Okay. So what does this have to do with COVID-19 and care home deaths? What does Hillsborough and Joseph's case have to do with each other? It's obvious. What is obvious is that they require in-depth, legally supported, inquisitorial coverage and research of those cases. They need the detail to be found. And that can only happen if an inquest is prepared for in an appropriate way and disclosure is gained. Okay. What have we seen here in the north of Ireland in recent weeks? The chief medical officer to the RQIA, the Quality Assurance Institute, stated that he wanted to reduce the frequency of its statutory inspections in care homes and to cease its non-statutory inspections. That was only on the 20th of March. We saw between March and April, the transfer of elderly patients from hospitals to care homes without testing. In other words, they were entering care homes having been in hospital and nobody knew whether they were carriers of the disease. On the 12th of May, the BBC Northern Ireland Spotlight investigation found that there had been a persistent failure to provide care home staff with even the most basic PPE. In other words, many of those working in care homes, right up to and including May, were working in a situation of danger. What we also know is that the recorded deaths in the, in the north of Ireland on the 15th of May, the latest we have figures for, was that 48.5% were in hospitals, but 45.6% were in care homes, which demonstrates clearly that care homes were at the front of the pandemic, that those working in care homes and those in care homes were facing a dangerous situation that was known, and they were doing it with poor protection, if any at all. Okay. So, people th I think that where we go from here is like Hillsborough, is like Joseph Rainey. It's two inquests where we will discover the truth of what happened to not all of those people who died, but for those where families believe that there was a contributory factor to their deaths within those care homes. Okay. I wrote to the Department of Health and I have a, a response at a senior level, which refers me on to other departments of government, but states quite categorically that COVID-19 is a natural illness. And therefore, under legislation, there is no requirement to report such deaths to the coroner. Okay. From the presiding coroner in the North, Mrs. Justice Keegan, I have a longer response, and this is a synopsis of it. There is no legislative authority for the automatic referral of care home deaths to the coroner. Should concerns be raised in relation to a death from COVID-19, the coroner could, could, he has the option, not will, but could investigate based on the individual merits of his, each case. And the coroner alone decides that to establish whether an inquest was necessary. The holding of an inquest is discretionary. And the coroner has discretion 
to investigate any death on a case-by-case -case basis. The question is, how does a coroner use that discretion on a case-by-case -case basis if the cases are not referred to the coroner? Okay. And where does the weight of responsibility for this lie? And this brings me back to Hillsborough. It brings me back to Mr. and Mrs. Rainey. The weight of responsibility is carried not by the state, not by institutions, but by grieving families, people who are in the, at the lowest ebb, people who are facing the most difficult days of their lives. Okay. So in terms of COVID-19, we look beyond inquests. Okay. Where do we start? Well, critical analysis, which is what my work is, is the historical, the political, economic, and socio-legal analysis of any event or series of events. That's what informed us in the cases I've talked about. That will inform us in terms of COVID-19. An embattled NHS, underfunded, under-resourced, overworked, Okay. Beyond that, the immediate circumstances, the context and aftermath. The issue here of the front line, the bereaved families, the communities, the media coverage. These are the circumstances, context and aftermath. These are the people, the front line workers, but also those bereaved, those communities that are bereft, and also an, ex an ex examination of whether or not the media coverage has been sufficiently testing of those in authority. Okay. The third element I've been talking about this evening, investigations and inquiry, government responses, institutional tensions, conflicted interests. We've seen them on our screens, on television, every night. We've heard them in every day's news. They have to be tested. They have to be understood. An inquiry is not simply into the events of COVID. It's an inquiry into the responses to COVID. Okay. All this takes me back to where I started. It's responding to the view from below. The personal experiences, public participation, community engagement. Hillsborough demonstrated to us that they were the key factors in actually winning the second inquests. They were the key factors in, the, in bringing the truth, as they were in the Joseph Rainey case. Okay. What I've been talking about is truth and accountability. Yes, I know the argument about truth being relative. I did 101 philosophy as well. But certain truths are truths. And the, what I've been talking about tonight is about establishing those truths but also bringing people to account, not to hang, draw, and quarter them, but to actually have them admit that the processes they had in place, the decisions that they took, the way they operated were inappropriate and adequate in the circumstances. Okay. Recovering truth, what a big demand that is on all of us to bear witness, and for those of us whose job it is to engage the inquiring mind. That is the basis of critical social research. And in doing this, to record the abuses of institutional power. It could have been me. It could have been you. It could have been your mother, father, 
son, daughter, and for some of those watching tonight, it is you. And we know that. And we honour it. It's about taking those personal troubles that I talked about at the beginning and turning them into public issues. These are issues for all of us. They're not just to be left for people to bear the brunt alone. They're about building alternative accounts. They're about establishing truth. And once established, accountability is delivered through acknowledgement, state acknowledgement, institutional acknowledgement, personal acknowledgement. Okay. Most significantly, we live in a democratic society. It's a society that by its very nature, by its very form in the Hobbesian sense of liberal democracy should be held to account to its people. We've already heard this evening that inquests and the circumstances in which people have died being explored a part of the process of holding the state to account, of institutions to account. Not just focusing on individuals who made mistakes, but institutional failures. And for me, they're about the establishment of panels of inquiry. I don't mean official inquiries. Official inquiries were held for many years where I live now in the north of Ireland, and they amounted to very little. I'm talking about panels of inquiry that are thoroughly investigative with teams that work together in the way in which the Hillsborough Independent Panel did. And the imperative is that they are not governmental inquiries, they are autonomous. And yes, they're paid for out of taxpayers' money, but they're paid for on behalf of taxpayers. That is the point. That is the point of their autonomy. It is only through those forms of inquiry and inquisition that we ever found out the truth of Hillsborough, that Mr. and Mrs. Rainey ever found out the truth of the death of Joseph. And these are two examples among many. We have to take this forward, their struggle forward into this new phase. And from now on, I am not concerned about being told that we have to wait for all of today's issues around COVID to pan out. And then there will be an inquiry. I've specified what it should be. I've specified how it should operate. And it might be more than one, but two issues for sure. They are panels of inquiry, bringing together a range of skills. And it is imperative that they're autonomous of state interests. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Phil. That couldn't be more timely uh, and certainly a very uh, important presentation. Um, there have been quite a few questions coming in. I think we've got about 20, 25 minutes um, to work our way through them. Uh, and I know you will do them justice. I'll so I'm going to take them in order. Um, Phil, do you think it is possible for bereaved families to be properly heard and to take part in remote inquests? I think it's imperative that they're properly heard through their representation. I think that one of the issues that is so significant now to organize the organization inquest is that we have legal teams, lawyers, who understand the issues around bereavement 
in contested circumstances, in institutions, or especially at the moment in terms of COVID. They're not lawyers who are there to simply make money out of a system. They are there to represent uh, truth and justice. And so, yes, it is, I do believe it is possible for them to be properly represented and through those lawyers properly heard. It's that issue that is so significant. I have at the moment a whole range of different uh, approaches from people to me directly, simply and solely because of the work I've done. In that, I try to pass on people to those who will represent them. In some cases, I take the cases myself, as happened with the Rainey case. So yes, it is possible for them to be heard. It is possible for us to share those stories and to believe those stories and to have appropriate and adequate legal representation at a time of real contestation. Okay, thank you, Phil. Um, there is a, a, a question more generally about uh, COVID-19 and inquest and inquiries. You've been into much of that, but I'm, I'm gonna pull out um, uh, one aspect of the question. And that's what the Prime Minister of Britain said uh, this afternoon to the committee panel. He said that a public inquiry into uh, the state's response to the coronavirus pandemic it wouldn't be a good use of official time. What's your view on that statement? Um, one word, disdain. I mean, there are, I, I'm, not only, I'm not only suggesting there should be one inquiry, one overarching inquiry. I'm suggesting there should be multiple inquiries because people are dying in different circumstances and those circumstances have to be understood. From my point of view, the whole point of inquiries, and I'm talking about here panels, the whole point is for people to have their voices heard. I think that in one sense, I would agree that the historic concept of public inquiries will be problematic. I have my concerns and they're well known and they're well, well written about, about Grenfell and the public inquiry into Grenfell. The most significant part of the Grenfell inquiry so far were the testimonies given by the families as to what actually happened on the night of the fire. Harrowing, deeply disturbing, but and very brave. But they were the most important element of the inquiry so far. That was only allowed because it was a public inquiry. What I want to hear is those voices in a different setting where those voices become the driver of the issues. That they're not just something that come at the beginning of an inquiry, they are inquisitorial in themselves. We can only build a real thorough understanding of what COVID means by understanding it from the perspective of from below the perspective of those who've endured and suffered. That's what brings us to the television every night. Boris Johnson and the five o'clock shadow and all of that doesn't bring us to the television at nighttime. What brings us to the television is to hear the stories from the front line, to hear the stories from those people who are administering as best they can to those who are dying and also to hear the stories of the recovered and to hear the stories of the bereaved. That's what brings us, not because we, we, we are prurient, it brings us because that is where the truth of it lies. If that doesn't come to the forefront of an inquiry, and I think that is what this government will be scared of, then from my perspective, the inquiry isn't worth holding. But I, I, I cannot believe that he said that. Thanks, Phil. Um, we've got a participant at home who is very interested in your views on Grenfell, and if you could uh, expand on that. In particular, the that overarching question, how can uh, the families of those who died at Grenfell seek justice? 
it's a big question, but the I, I I had in the middle of my presentation a four a four part it's like a four part model if you like, um, which I I I would apply very directly to Grenfell. Grenfell is significant because there is a long history of that particular apartment block, so it isn't without with a great deal of imagination that we don't that we that we have to um, present the first part of such an inquiry. It's the historical, the political, econo economic, and the social elements of how that tower block came to be built in the context in which it was at the time and all that goes with that. The housing strategy and then the organizational strategy, the local authority responsibility, housing that is the first issue and that has to be done critically and it has to take evidence from the residents associations and all those people who had been warning about Grenfell and in other tower blocks as well then there is the element of the immediate circumstances what happened on the night the immediate context the potential delays all of this has been rehearsed by the families and then the immediate aftermath, what comes in the immediate days that followed, how the whole process was adapted during that period. And then I want inquiry, I want to inquire into the inquiry, how that was set up, who it hears from, who is making the who are making the cases, what interests are represented. That to me, governments use inquiries. Governments need inquiries, but not always for the best intentions. And what are the institutional tensions that come out? What are the conflict of interest? That was the third point I made in that slide. And then, most importantly, with Grenfell, unusually, what we have is a great deal of testimony that came right at the beginning. That was the view from below. And that is the view that takes us into the final stage of Grenfell, which will be the inquests. That's where those stories will need to be told again. So from my point of view, community engagement, public participation, and personal experiences are how we build the analysis of what happened in Grenfell. And the thing that we can see most clearly is there's such a diversity of people involved but there is an incredible consistency in their stories. That tells us something that needs to be fully explored and it needs to be in the open. So from my point of view, one government inquiry established in the way in which it has been and all of the comes with it, all the baggage of historic inquiries is not sufficient. I made that very clear right at the beginning. I made it very clear to government I made it very clear to government departments. And it'll come as no surprise for people to know that I got no reply. OK, thank you, Phil. Um, I, I'm dying to ask you a, a question uh, myself, so I'm, I'm going to take a couple of minutes of everyone's valuable time. Has there ever been a good public inquiry? Has there ever been one that, that's actually done the business, that's actually um, it's an interesting question. I mean, everybody would, would, would point at Bloody Sunday, very expensive, you know, all the rest probably be now not expensive by comparison to all the funding that's had to go into Hillsborough. Um, but, um, and rightly so into Hillsborough, I might add. Um, but that came out with a, a ma major findings uh, that obviously brought a double apology from the Cameron government. I, I, doubt, I don't think there could have been any other resolution to the Bloody Sunday inquiry, like there, was, there couldn't have been any other resolution to our Hillsborough panel than, than that which was delivered. But look at what it took to get to that stage. Look how many years. Look at how so many previous inquiries, and Bill Rolston and I have, have written a major article on this, how many inquiries that preceded um, pre pre preceded uh, the uh, Bloody Sunday inquiry that got it wrong, that actually covered the tracks. So 
that's why I'm so skeptical. I'm skeptical because the way it works is that a, a senior judge or a senior other person is brought in with all of the history that they have in their work. And I'm not saying that it's all irrelevant, but it comes from a perspective. They are brought in by a government. The government then supplies all of the support for that inquiry. If it is the government that is actually under scrutiny, the question then that has to be asked is how independent is it really? And that's where we get to the nub of it. I think it was way back in 1993, I wrote a critique of public inquiries following the work of Pat Carlin. I wrote a critique of public inquiries. And in that critique, I demonstrated absolutely clearly how every public inquiry to that point had placed people had that I was analyzing had placed people. It almost was structured around a given narrative. That's what I want. When we set up the Hillsborough Independent Panel, what was important was to go into the panel with no preconceived narrative, to go into the panel with open eyes, to let the documents speak for themselves, to inquire and chase those down, those documents. And that was unpopular. It was unpopular with many of the organizations that supplied those documents. Very unpopular. Because they knew absolutely clearly that the end product of what they were giving us and the analysis of that would be the 153 findings that we made. Okay, on to a question from uh, an audience member. Um, a question I'm sure you'll be kind of very, very glad to answer. What changes uh, could be made to the coroner's court uh, and legal processes around it to hold individuals and institutions to account for state custody deaths? And uh, that uh, audience member has put a, a supplementary question in there. Can and should the coroner's court be abolished? No, uh, I'll go. I'll take the second one first. No, because so many people, including Inquest and many and and many others who have worked in the law, have worked very hard to try and bring reform to the coroner's inquest and see the coroner's inquest potentially as being a site of real inquisition, as it's called. And that is uh, where people will have an opportunity to um, to hear evidence that they previously might not have heard. Uh, if you abolished it, what would we be left with? We'd be left with the criminal law and the criminal law text uh, test, which is that there has to be a, a more than even chance of gaining a conviction. And we've seen the problems with that, especially in Hillsborough in the early days. Now, inquests are really important places, providing that we have critical coroners, providing that the um, legal teams have equality of... Uh, arms, as it's called in the law. What this means is, at the moment, I can give you an example, an example of a case without naming the case, an example of a case in England where there was a serious death. Uh, all deaths are serious, but a death in, in contested circumstances. They looked to the coroner's court for some sort of resolution. The four authorities that were involved were able to hire the most expensive legal teams out of, in some cases, the public purse in order to defend their interests because they knew that this was a contested death. And although it's an inquest, it's, in, it's the adversarial wolf in sheep's clothing. The family had to beg, steal and borrow in order to have their representation. There is no equality of arms. The difference with Hillsborough was that the government decided that the families could have legal aid. Here in the north of Ireland, in the case of Joseph Rainey, because the law is different, the family could have legal aid. So until we have legally aided inquests, 
until we have inquests where negligence, the word negligence is extended in the legal in the legal frame to mean potential, potentially people were put into a position through negligence, i.e., i.e., may, maybe state negligence, government negligence, departmental negligence, as I would argue, has happened in COVID. Until we have that brought into the frame, we will see the discretion of coroners to not hold inquests in those cases. I want to see them treated in the same way as what we call Article 2 deaths. Deaths in prison, for example, is an Article 2 death. And that is because it flies in the face of international legislation in terms of the right to life. And if the right to life has been compromised institutionally, then in that situation, all of that should be brought under the remit of the coroner's court, not at the coroner's discretion, but automatically. The final thing I would say is that years ago, I might have said, yeah, I think that perhaps this is the end for the current coronal inquest. Maybe we should look for a different issue, different form. But I've seen in the last few years, a whole range of recruitments to the coroner's uh, to the coroner's role across England and here in the north of Ireland that actually demonstrate to me that coroners themselves are holding a different perspective on what their case on what their courts can do and what solace they can bring to families but the court will never be a court of liability it will be indicative liability so let me go back to the cases I've just quoted. In Hillsborough, what we had were pages, 25 contributory factors to the death. So they're not holding any one person personally liable, but they are saying that those institutions failed. In the Rainey case, in Joseph's case, they're not saying that this individual prison officer or this individual manager was caused the death. What they're saying is the process that they operated. Therefore, there is institutional liability. And that, to me, is why a coroner's court can deliver. It can deliver to families the failure, not of one individual person, but of a collective failure that is an institutional failure. And that, for me, is worth keeping. OK, thank you, Phil. And as you were speaking there, um, we received a message from Joseph Ray and his father. Um, and the message says, Joseph Ray and his father here, uh, the coroner and Joseph case, Joseph's case gave us justice, as did the coroner's court. Thanks to Phil and our legal team. That's very kind. Thank you very much to the family. Thank you. I really that's really kind. I'm going to move on to uh, a, a couple more questions. I think we've got uh, another five minutes to answer these. Um, the fight for justice is a long drawn out process with the truth being hidden and often manipulated by the state. What can new campaigns such as Grenfell and COVID-19 care home deaths learn from the Hillsborough family's quest for justice to have speedy resolutions? I think the most important issue, and I'm not going to advise families, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of families, but my observation from outside is coherence. That these, we have to remember that these events are occurring at a time when people are literally on their knees. Contested deaths, deaths that are unjust, bring people to their knees. Many families haven't even got the strength to be able to deal with the process. And we've seen that in almost all circumstances of multiple deaths. What is important is coherence. What is important is that families themselves are heard, that people don't come in from outside with whatever political agenda they might have as leaders, as spokespeople, that people become spokespeople or represent families because the families wish it. 
not because an agenda of whatever sort is imposed on them. But the most important issue is, from my point of view, is coherence. Is staying together, having disagreements, keeping those disagreements behind closed doors, not allowing any, any form of disquiet to show out externally so that the collective can protect its interests, to gain good advice from those people who have already represented families in contested deaths, good lawyers, good workers in, in a whole range of different in a whole range of different forums. And of course, I'm bound to say this, but taking support from organizations, and there is really only one that stands out, which is Inquest. And Inquest has gone in the early 1980s from a small organization that was actually fighting the corner of so many families, and I was there at the beginning, to now being one of the most formidable human rights organizations in Europe. And I think that the importance of inquest cannot be overstated. Therefore, taking advice from the workers at inquest, taking advice from lawyers, and they will certainly put put families in touch with lawyers who will, will give their time, will give their energy, and give their views. But coherence has to be the way forward. Once state institutions, once those involved in the institution can, are able to talk down families or talk to families in a way where they sow the seeds of division or emphasize division, that's when we see organizations that are set up with great intentions falling apart. Okay, thanks, Phil. I'm going to ask one more question. Uh, I think we've got a, a couple more minutes. We often hear those in power saying lessons will be learned. Do you think this is an overused uh, phrase that's uh, a political throwaway? Um, actually, you know, I don't, because lessons are learned and tracks are covered more successfully the next time round. Okay. <laughs> A lesson that is learned is how to avoid this process happening again. And I'll give you just a very small personal example. People said to me after Hillsborough, oh my goodness, what has been achieved and the way in which it's been achieved and the comprehensive analysis of 10,000 documents taken from 2 million documents supplied by 80 different organizations. What has been learned is now going to be a blueprint for how critical analysis will continue. And Phil, you better not take any holidays because your phone won't stop ringing. And I turned round to my friend and I said, I'm going on holiday because my phone will never ring again. And I was right. It hasn't rung again. I think that is the message in terms of the power of critical analysis, that it can't be tolerated. Once bitten, 10 times shy. Okay, thank you, Phil. I'm going to draw this evening's incredibly thought provoking, um, forensically analytical, and I use that term forensic quite deliberately, knowing its etymology. Uh, and I want to thank you very much, Phil, for, uh, for uh, your, your, uh, presentation this evening. I'm going to plug a couple more writing on the wall events. Um, I looked at our calendar of activities earlier on uh, today and um, uh, I realised that this is the 27th event uh, that we're having here now and uh, if March saw writing on the wall have to unfortunately cancel its 20th anniversary uh, festival. Uh, April we really did pull Wool, uh, wow fest 
uh, lockdown out of the bag. Um, and what's coming up next? Well, let's just have a quick look at my phone. Um, on Friday, an event that's um, getting quite a lot of traction called Questioning the Status Quo, Francesca and Raul Martinez in conversation. Um, again, another presentation uh, around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the issues that it's revealing. Um, and then um, closing our festival on Sunday, the 31st of May, we have the former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, with a presentation called A Call to the Arts. And then after that, lockdown with the legendary Levi Tafari. So my name's Stuart Bortwick. I'm Chair of Writing on the Wall. Thank you very much for um, tuning in and listening to us and viewing us this evening. I hope you found the uh, presentation from Phil as interesting as I did. Thank you very much for attending and see you all soon. Bye bye.